Here I am in my favourite river again with my favourite leaky waders. And the reason I'm here today is that I'm looking for juvenile kingfishers. Now during lockdown I've watched the kingfishers flying up and down this brook. Um, but I haven't been able to easily pinpoint the nest because I haven't been able to get in the river. Now that I'm able to get in the river in my dodgy waders, um, I can find out the territories and where they are. Now I'm not interested in photographing them at the nest because it's illegal. You need a Schedule 1 licence. Uh, from here, from the Countryside Council for Wales. I would normally get one, but they've got a lot better things to do right now during coronavirus than to give me a Schedule 1 licence. So I'm going to find the territories along here. I might find the nest. It's certainly not used anymore because there are juvenile kingfishers out and about. And juvenile kingfishers are utterly stupid. I mean, normal kingfishers are stupid enough as it is, but juvenile kingfishers, they do not have a brain cell within them. So if I can find them on the river, I should be able to sit close. I've got my camouflage gear in here and my 300. I should be able to sit close enough to get a picture of them and you never know, the parents might be feeding them and providing I'm in position and well camouflaged before they come up, I might get a feeding shot, yes! But the only way to get it is for me to walk the river and look. So, see you later, I just love doing this. Now this was the first place that I thought I'd found the kingfishers because there's lots of poo coming down. It's a perfect overhang as well. It's exactly where they love to be. But the poo comes from lots of birds like goldfinches getting the seeds above like that. So it's not kingfisher, unfortunately, even though it's a perfect place. And personally, I would nest there. They obviously don't want to. And I think one of the reasons may be that it's actually in direct sunlight for a lot of the time. Perfect for Mr. Rouse's photography, uh, not perfect maybe for raising chicks. So uh, this one's a no-go, I better go and look a bit further. You know, I just love wading like this. It's just fantastic. You see so much from being actually in the river than on the footpath up there where you can't see anything. Um, the river is just alive. It's the most amazing ecosystem. And I don't think I have ever seen so much wildlife as this here. It's just, just fantastic. Just can't find any kingfishers yet. All right, success. About an hour and a half ago, I found this hole that you can see there. Um, there's loads of poo coming out of it. It's definitely a kingfisher nest hole with the overhang. It's perfect with all the branches around. Um, it's just poo everywhere. Now, the passage of time is because I didn't want to immediately, as soon as I walked by, I got the hell out of here, walked further up the river about 60 meters so I could see, got my binoculars out, sat in a bush, and waited because the last thing I want to do is be here talking to you when that's, that's a kingfisher nest and an active one, which it isn't by the way, because as I watched kingfishers have come by me in twos, which means parent and very dim youngster um, going by backwards and forwards up the river, but not once did they stop. Now a couple of times they stopped here on this branch and actually had a bit of feeding and on this branch right here. So what I'm going to go and do, uh, because it's not an active nest, it's okay. I'm going to sit over there in the reeds uh, with my camouflage gear on. Look, it's a hiding to nothing, right? I've got no idea they're going to come here, but it's a really nice place to sit. And if you sit quietly, it's amazing what you can see. But I do know from experience that kingfishers like to repeatedly come back to the nest site, especially the ultra dim youngsters. So let's see how we get on. Hello, hello. Here I am all set up in my bag hide, as you can see. Um, I've got the 300 here 
resting on my knee and I'm actually using the screen, looking down right on the screen that I've got turned up to take pictures. Why am I doing that? Well, it gives me a stable platform, um, but also I don't want to be raising the camera up to my eye like this when the kingfishers, if they come, because even though they're stupid, they're not that stupid. So I've got comfortable in here. I can see everything that's going on. I can see the perch over there. So now it's just a question of staying still, listening and waiting. That's what I do best. Kingfisher update. Um, I've had a couple of them come by me going that way, um, which is really good. And they weren't peeping when they came by, which means they didn't see me or realize I was a threat, which is great. So let's just see if they come back fingers crossed I've got my fingers crossed you can't really see but there you go and just a small point of order um, I've got red ants crawling over me inside here which is delightful so that means I'm sitting right by a red ant nest which is absolutely wonderful Ralph so you do certainly pick the best places to sit and a wet bottom may be the least of my worries I can hear some peeping. I can hear some peeping around the corner. Hold on. There's Kingfisher, Kingfisher, Kingfisher. Coming in, coming in, coming in. Okay, it's on the branch. So I'm slowly, slowly, slowly moving my lens up onto the branch. I'm gonna slowly tilt my head down and now I'm looking at the screen, moving the focus point up to where the Kingfisher is. 800 F4 plus 0.3, that's well good. Finger down on the shutter and well, yeah, of course you can't hear anything because it's silent mode. 20 frames a second of love in silent mode, so the kingfisher can't hear anything. I'm too far for it to hear me. It's just shifted along on the branch. It's actually looking for fish in the water. I think there's a second one further downstream as well. Amazing. Definitely a juvenile. Female, I think, but I'll just confirm that when I have a look. But that's amazing. And it shows what you get if you're patient, okay? If you're patient, you get your reward always. <laughs> well, that was incredible. Um, they came up, I had one actually in the distance, but one came a lot closer here and sat. I was able to get some nice pictures of it, I think against the canopy, I think it's a juvenile female. Um, there's certainly, you know, there's no nest activity, which is great. Um, if the parents had been coming back um, and starting to go into the nest, maybe to build a second nest or something else, I would have got out of here, okay? Um, but they didn't. So I'm maybe hoping that it's early enough in the season where they'll have a second brood. And if I can find that nest site and get a license, then I can bring you the wonders of kingfishers. But today I hope I have, because it's just been an interesting experience sitting in the river doing the juveniles. It's given me an idea as well for something else to try, because on this stretch of the river, is my uh, wagtail bathing pool. And there are plenty of fish there with no overhanging branches. So maybe if I put a branch up, I may be able to get one of the kingfishers in front of the hide. Anyway, it's time to go now because um, I don't want to outstay my welcome on the river. It's been fantastic. And to be honest, I'm getting tired of having a wet bum. I must get some new waders. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome to the Wild Man Rouse critique section. As always, I'll spend a couple of minutes only on each picture, seeing what I can do to improve its look, its feel and its punch. So thanks for sending them all in. And let's start with this great image of a wren from Mike Roberts. Um, beautifully sharp, beautifully in focus. Really nice composition looking across into dead space. If you want to learn more about composition, we're talking about it now in the Composition Masterclass webinar. New dates will be along very soon. Uh, but this is a lovely, lovely um, composition looking into the space. I can see it's a little bit windy because it's blowing the back of the wren's head up. See if you've got another one, Mike, that doesn't have that uh, fluffing uh, by the wind. It's okay, uh, but if you've got another one that hasn't got that, it would be a lot better. Um, what have I actually done to it? Well. Not a lot, because it's a really good picture. It's lovely and sharp. It's got a lovely background, lovely uh, log. All I have done, as you'll see here, is I've cropped it um, in a little bit more because we didn't really need um, a lot of that excess space that was in the image. 
I've also brought up more detail in the wren and I've added a touch of colour to the wren and also to the lichens actually on the post. That's all I've done uh, literally in two minutes because it's a really good picture to start with. So that kind of helped everything. So well, well done. Well, well done. Well, well done, Mike. Now, here's a great picture from Tony. I expect Tony to produce good bird images because he absolutely loves his birds. It's a lovely kestrel in flight. Uh, wings outstretched there uh, really, really nicely. Um, you can't help the branches in the background because it's obviously taken off from the tree or as you'll see later, maybe something else. Um, so I've done a few little things to it. Um, I've cropped it to start with because you don't need a lot of the excess tree information on the right hand side. It just spoils the composition. I've got the leading line going out of the top there, which helps frame that side. Um, if you want to be pedantic, you could remove those trees down below. Personally, I wouldn't. They don't bother me. I've brought out more detail on the kestrel's wings. Kate has got a little bit of shadow there, so I've highlighted it a bit and done a little bit of coloration on it. Um, the one thing I haven't done is sharpen it because the head is slightly out of focus. It's because of the motion. It's nothing to do with the focus because it's all sharp uh, because you can see. So it's just the motion that's done that and that probably the head was moving and turning away like that. So what I might do is selectively put some focus on the head only uh, just to sharpen it up a bit. But other than that, really, really great picture, Tony. Well done. And here's another one. That's what I said about, you know, we're not quite sure what was happening. Um, the kestrel is not predating the pigeon, okay? Um, the kestrel is probably coming in and just pushing the pigeon off of the stump there and attacking it for some reason. Um, but it's a very, very nice picture. I really like it. It's got really good action. Um, and, you know, pictures like this, you know, they're achieved by having a good knowledge of your subject and spending good time in the field. And I don't really want to do a lot to pictures like this. Don't eat hobnobs before you're about to present. Um, yeah, another useless um, tip for you. So what I've done is crop this a bit more because I want to remove all the surplus, su superfluous stuff in the background uh, and just concentrate on the action and bring the action out. Under the chest there, it's a bit darker, the kestrel, because it's in the shadow of the pigeon. So I've lightened that a bit for you. Put a bit more color on um, just, the, just the pigeon and the kestrel throughout. Um, looked at some of the tones and that's all really I haven't done a lot so it's, it's mainly the cropping I've done uh, with the wing uh, very tight against that right hand edge just to make you focus on where the action is rather than where the tree is which I don't really care about you've done a really nice job here Tony so well done to, mate 10 out of 10. Now Shanyu is a 15 year old Indian photographer and he wrote to me uh, very humbly I have to say with the expectation of not being used well <laughs> don't write to me if you don't want to be shown um, I like showing young people's work and I don't discriminate on age, race, uh, sexual preference or anything else or camera system. Or I don't care because photography doesn't care, okay? Um, I just care about helping everybody that I can uh, to achieve the maximum that they can. Um, so Shanyu, I picked a few images of tigers. Yeah, I know. Uh, these are all from Bandov Gar, so uh, not somewhere that I go, but I'm just looking at this purely from a tiger aspect. So 15 year old, has sent me his best tiger picture, so well done. As usual, I spent two minutes each. Now, this is very, very nice. I can see what you've tried to do with your high key approach here. Um, it, it's it's really smart thing to do because the light probably wasn't the best. And so, you know, converting it to black and white, putting it in high key, good idea. The problem is there's a bit too much right hand side there where there's nothing really going on. We don't have any tree there or anything to offset it. So what I've done, I've cropped it into a 16 by nine format. Um, so you can see it's much better on the screen. Um, it, it's not got so much rubbish then on the right hand side there. It's going to concentrate on the tiger a bit more, which is a little bit more towards the center of the frame. And I've stuck some more detail in it because we were losing a lot of detail behind. Um, if you're going to wipe this out and do high key, you've got to really go high key plus four stops. So you've just got stripes and stuff like that. Um, I don't think you want to do that. I think you probably want to retain some detail. So I put some more detail in the background for you. Um, and I think that looks really, really nice. So well done, good idea. Of course, when you go uh, looking at tigers, um, you see a lot more uh, besides tigers. And a uh, beautiful shot of an owl here in the tree. Uh, really, really nicely composed, actually. Apart from one thing, it's on this side. So the tree is in the centre, but the owl is in the centre, and it's looking slightly that way. So unfortunately, there's not enough space for me to redress it. Um, I'll show you what I did in a second, but the thing that bugs people like me uh, that review pictures and everybody uh, that does this kind of thing are these white borders. 
please don't put white borders around your pictures when you send them to people. It's very, very irritating for us to have to remove them. Uh, and certainly in competitions, it doesn't help. So yeah, on social media, it might make it stand out. Uh, but when you're sending your pictures out, don't send them out with the white borders, okay? So there's my tip for you. So I've removed the white border and I've shifted the owl across as much as I actually could. I can't shift it across anymore because I kind of want to hold in this side of the, the frame. So I've shifted it across. I haven't done anything with the light um, at all. I've just left as it is. Um, you can see as another owl there, by zooming in and shifting it, you can see now there's another owl inside the hole. Uh, if you brighten that up, it's false as well. So I'm not gonna brighten that up, it's completely false. I'm not gonna brighten that owl up in the hole because that's the natural light on it and it looks really cool and I want to keep this picture natural because Shen Yu, I think you really like your pictures natural, that's what I see. So really, really well done. Annoying background again, <laughs> which I've had to remove. Now, the problem here is that you've enhanced the eyes. Um, I can see that you've done it because the eyes are never that color um, in a cave. In fact, I, know, I actually know where that cave is, uh, but the eyes are never that color. So just, just don't do that to tigers, okay? Don't really brighten the eyes to make them fierce because it often gives the wrong message. Uh, we don't want tigers to appear fierce. We want people to conserve them um, and have them fierce doesn't help us. But also it does look false and the tiger has got too much saturation on it. Um, so you have to be very careful when you layer the saturation. The place for the saturation here is the beautiful rocks. The composition is fantastic. What you've done is brilliant. You've got the tiger in a nice place at the bottom, stretched across with this beautiful rock formation above. And all I've done is enhance that a slight deal, remove that white border again. And I've looked at the corners here about where in the top corners some lines will be going in just to help to flow it out of the picture a bit more. Um, I've put some color on the top and some color on the rocks. I can't remove the color on the tiger because it's so strong, it's been, it's been saturated, and I can't do anything about the eyes. You can tell by the saturation by the tongue. So what I would do is go back to the raw and I would, I would redo it all. I would put the saturation um, on the rocks and the crop like I've done here, but I would, I would not put so much saturation on the tiger. Yeah, a little bit, but not so much. You don't have to saturate your images. Um, if it wasn't in sunlight, it wasn't in sunlight. So don't try to make it in sunlight. It's a really brilliant picture of the composition. Just be proud of it and just enhance what needs to be enhanced. Okay, so you did really, really well. Excellent composition, really proud of you. Well done, thanks for sending in your pics. Oh, Vlad from Romania, I think, uh, has, has sent these in. And Vlad's been a long time follower of mine. And I'm very, very glad that you sent these in because he sent in some dippers. And it's something that I've fouled at dismally this season <laughs> because of lockdown, of course. Uh, we have one here on the river, uh, but it's quite a long wade and it's in a very dark place under the bridge. So I'm going to put a nest box up for next season. Um, anyway, really lovely picture of a dipper uh, feeding screaming young or thinking, yeah, should I feed it? Um, Good angle here, good field craft, takes a lot of skill to get into this position, a lot of patience, and a lot, a lot of luck as well. I'm not interested about the fact you can't see the bird's foot or anything that, we're not, I'm not bothered about that. These are wild bird shots that I just want to try and do something about. So here's what I've done. Okay, so you can see I've done a lot there. I've brought out the detail greatly, okay, because you didn't have the color of the dipper in it. So that lovely chest there, I've brought that out. I've brought the detail on the dipper and the young. I've increased the saturation on the rocks for you to bring you some color. I've increased the color in the blue behind and I've cropped it to focus in on the action. I don't care about, you know, what the right crop should be. I'm only interested in the right crop for the picture. And if you want to learn more about this, Composition Masterclass is the one to be on. That's the one where I talk about cropping. But it's a really lovely image. I love the way the foreground flows out into the dipper there. And I hope that you can see that just a couple of minutes work has really lifted uh, a great picture. Look at this one, really, really clever. I like this. Slow shutter speed, obviously, to get the, uh, to get the waterfall uh, there coming down. And of course, slow shutter speed, you often get a little bit of dipper movement. And that's the issue um, all the time I've done this. And you always get a little bit of dipper movement. So you've got to take a lot and you've got to be steady when you do it. Uh, because one time, the dipper won't dip <laughs> and it won't move. Um, because you need to be probably a third of a second or even slower to get this. Um, a couple of things where I need to correct. First of all, the, the foreground is too bright compared to the background, the highlight and the water. And uh, well, the one thing I didn't do, you can see there's some dust spots. When you shoot at a slow shutter speed with full frame sensors, particularly, um, you pick up all the dust spots and I can see there's a couple in the water. So I haven't done the dust spots, but what I've done is first of all, change the crop. Um, I've, I've taken the water down, so you've got much more water detail there that you can see. I hope that you like that. Let me go back and show you. So that was before. 
So this is after my two minutes. So you've got a lot more interesting water detail, detail on the rocks, it's not burnt out, more detail on the bird standing there. Um, obviously it's a young one. Um, I assume it's a dipper actually, maybe I got that wrong, but I assume it is. Um, but it's really, really nice against the waterfall anyway. It's really great and I've just toned it down a bit. Now, I did look a couple of variations for this flag for you. Um, I cropped it in a bit more, uh, so we got a little bit more of the bubbles, because I really like those bubbles, okay? I love those bubbles there. I think they're really, really cool. And so I cropped it in so we could get some more bubbles, and then I tried it in black and white and gave it a, a, a bit of a black and white process just to see if I liked it. I'm not sure. I think I might prefer the original one, but variations is a big key uh, to any photography, and learning variations is a big skill. So I hope that you enjoyed the critiques there. Thank you very much for listening, and feel free to send them in. Remember, all the details are underneath the video. Thank you. See you next time. Hope that you enjoyed the main show. I love showing anybody kingfishers. I really, really love them. Um, and thank you very much again for the critiques. Now, I want to tell you about a big change to uh, Wild Angle that we've been speaking about for the past few weeks. It's called Zoomed In, and it's going to be an extended content now on the end of the main show. So the main show will always be free. You'll always get my antics of wandering around in the river, getting a wet bum with my dodgy waders, showing you some pictures, and also my critique. So please send your pictures in, because I want to keep critiquing them. I love doing it. But now, after that section, we will get the zoomed in feature where we will go into extended depth about some of the discussion points and some of the techniques that we've used in that film. And that's because you've asked us to do that. Now, it takes a lot of extra time to do it and to edit it. So we're going to charge a bit for it. It's going to be two quid. Two quid? Yep, that's the initial offer that it's going to be. Um, it's less than the price of a trendy coffee. And for that, you're going to get a double length show. Um, now, for example, this week after this little bit of spill here um, you're going to get an extended discussion on schedule one licenses and kingfishers and other birds so do you need a license about being close to the nest you're going to get me analyzing the pictures that i shot here um, a few weeks ago um, of the kingfishers actually on the branches i didn't take a lot but i've gone into quite a lot of compositional and tech analysis of them for you and then i'm going to look at photographing kingfishers in the rain and some of the techniques about photographing kingfishers in those kind of conditions because it's not just about getting a kingfisher on a stick with a sunny background. If you get rain, you can get some really, really interesting pictures. So that extra content is going to be free now. So you're gonna see that um, here. And then next time on the next episode, uh, you will see that the extra content will be a couple of quid, which is to say, it's not much to pay, but I guarantee you, you're gonna get a lot of extra hints and tips. So without further ado, let's begin. Hello and welcome to Zoomed In in my lovely studio. You can see here with the people I love, Sean with his wig. We don't ask about Sean with his wig. Um, and bottles of plonk from my last KLM flight uh, that I will be tempted to go for in a minute. Now, I wanted to talk to you uh, today uh, about shooting kingfishers in the rain because I hear stories that a lot of people cancel their hide bookings because it's raining. Rain gives you amazing atmosphere, it's incredible. So please don't cancel. Here's some tips to show you. Look at that, that's my, that's my swipe, see? Um, here's the first picture. You think it's virtual, but it's, it's, it's all done afterwards. That's how slick I am. Oh, I did it again. Um, all right, this picture is a 60th of a second because the way that we have the rain in the pictures is controlled by the shutter speed, okay? So generally, the lower you are, the longer you get your streaks, okay? Now, there wasn't much rain here. I wish there was a lot more rain and I could show you longer and thicker streaks and a lot more of them. But this is all I've got for kingfishers and I want to keep on kingfishers today. But you can see those long, long streaks. Now, you can only see rain against the dark background. So if you're trying to shoot against a white sky or a blue sky or something, you won't see the rain at all. The darker the background, the better it is. And it's better the more backlit it is. So if there's a bit of sun in the distance, you know, it's raining a shower over the top of you and it's lighting it from behind, it, as you'll see in a minute, it will be magical, magical and magical. So this is a 60th of a second, okay? Now let's look, this is a 200th. 
Notice we've got our streaks that are a little bit smaller, but it's really beautiful as well. We can all brighten the Kingfisher. Don't worry about the fact, oh, it's too dark, you know, because it's raining. It's not too dark, it's because you exposed it too dark, okay? You just expose it normally or put plus a third on it and maybe do a bit of painting afterwards and it will come out really, really beautiful. But look at that lovely drifty rain all over it. It allows you to shoot your Kingfisher wider, which gives it more appeal and more punch to anyone that looks at it. It also allows you to have a wider picture to take into the dark room. Otherwise, you know, your workstation where you dress in your leather suit and have your my joysticks going off and your vodka in one hand and you do your processing darling well you may not dress in a leather suit but <laughs> i know we do don't we sean yeah enough of that um so anyways <laughs> where was it so you know if you've got this lovely rain effect you are you, you you will shoot wider because you'll want to shoot wider because you need to show the rain coming in this picture is composed slightly on the right hand side as well so the rain comes in from the top into the Kingfisher. It's got a very, very simple branch. You need to keep your rain pictures very, very simple. So Kingfisher on a stick is perfectly acceptable anywhere to do. You just need to keep it simple and keep the rain as the big element in the picture. Yeah, wow, look at that. And this is a 640th of a second. And generally, forget all the numbers. I say above a 500th, you get the dots everywhere, depending on how hard it's falling, of course. And generally, 250th and below, you start to get more streaks, and 60th is good for streaks. Of course, 60th, you might get a bit of motion, so you've got to be careful. Whereas at 640th, the king, kingfisher might have a bit of a twitch, uh, but you won't get much motion uh, blur in it. But you can see there's that lovely effect. And again, the composition that comes in, flows in from the bottom, round of the kingfisher, and back out that side. It's a lovely, simple composition. It's looking into most of the dead space on there. Um, and it's got this lovely rainfall down against the dark background. It looks great. People will like this picture. They will comment in it. They will say, oh, you're such a hero because you've been out in the rain. Let me buy your picture. And you'll say, yeah, I was out in the rain. And I, oh, I suffered for hours. And yes, please buy my picture. Um, seriously, look, it looks better because it's got rain. Trust me. So that's that at 640th. Oh, look at this. Now, this is at a 1600th of a second. And you think, oh, my God. Well, you said a minute ago, Rousey boy, um, that it was, you know, 500th and above you get the dots. Well, not if it's teeming down cats and dogs and every other animal it can find to chuck out of the sky. Uh, it was really raining. You can see the water uh, there at the bottom. You can see, look at the pond. Water's coming off the pond. So it's really, really coming down. But look at the atmosphere that that picture's got. So that's a 1600th of a second. That's actually ISO 16,000. <laughs> and that's just to get the motion of the Kingfisher coming out of the water because I, I, it, it wasn't sitting on the branch for long. And I wanted to do something different, OK? It was tremendous with this rain. Look at the atmosphere in it. And you'd have missed that because you've, you'd have cancelled this for your sunny day. And what would you got a sunny day? You might have got beautiful pictures, but you wouldn't have got them with so much atmosphere in them as this. I really love it. There's a simpler one, slightly wider, uh, same kind of habitat, same shutter speed, two thousandth of a second. So you've got your raindrops there, but it just adds something. The composition is on the left, flowing across there. You can see to the other side. It's caught in midair. It's just lovely droplets everywhere. So you can see that the higher you go on shutter speed, as long as you, you know, uh, as long as you get it high enough to stop the kingfisher in motion, which is generally two thousandth and above, um, you'll get the raindrops stopped as well, and it gives you an extra impetus to your pictures. So don't stop going out just because it's raining. Look, what happens if you get backlight? That's what happens if you get backlight. Look at that. I'm doing street now. Look. Cry. Uh, street now. Look at the backlight on the rain. Really dark background. Dark forest. Not Rousey doing it. Dark forest. Sun coming in this way. Slightly backlit. Okay. But enough light to light up the side of the Kingfisher. Um, but look what it did to the rain. Oh my God, this is a shutter speed of 1600th of a second. Look at that, 5.6 background uh, f-stop. Um, but look at the atmosphere in that picture. And yeah, the kingfisher's turning away. You wouldn't think it's a perfect pose, but look at it, um, with the rain, and because it's lovely and wide, it gives you something else. Do you get the message by now? And last but not least, um, the picture I shot uh, as a launch image for uh, the 1DX2 when I was uh, Canon ambassador. Um, I love this. This is 2,000th of a second. You know, it's a combination of water coming um, out of the pond and water falling from the sky. Um, I wish, and I'm always honest like this, I'd have shot it wider. I wish I'd have shot it 
much with much more space with the water coming down it would have been great but i hope that you've seen with this little segment here that shooting in the rain is mega so remember the rules keep the background dark if you want to see the rain keep the aperture low five six to eight maximum see so because you don't want the background to become distracting in the picture you just want it to be there and two fiftieth of a second and below gives you the streaks, whichever way they go, and then increasing it 500th and above the shutter speed will get you increasingly dots, dots, and dots, and dots. You don't have to go too high to get it, you know, thousandth is probably enough, but if you want to stop the motion of a kingfisher, it's at least a two thousandth. So please, next time you book a hide or do some kingfisher photography and it's rainy, go out and really enjoy it, get some great pictures and send me them, because I hope this has been useful to you. See you next time. Well, it's been about three weeks since the action was right here. It's all moved downstream now, and it's been brilliant down there. I put the post up, and you'll see later on in a future wild angle, wow, wow, and wow. Now, since then, the parents have been going up and down the river looking at all of these banks. And because I know all of these banks on the river, I know it really intimately now because I've waded it, um, I've been watching from vantage points and seeing where they're looking at because they're certainly looking for a new nest. Now, because I mentioned the word nest and kingfishers are a protected species under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, it means it causes a bit of a dilemma because technically you need a Schedule 1 license from one of the licensing, licensing authorities to be within range of the nest. But of course, the range is never, ever mentioned. It doesn't say you can't go within. It just says you, you need to have a reason to be close to the nest. OK, so either scientific purposes and research or photographic and filmmaking. So if I want to sit here with a hide, with the nest there, OK, that's, that's potentially got the, the, the way to cause disturbance. And so I would need to have a license to put my hide this close. But if I went, let's say, 50 metres down the river that way, or even 20 metres down the river that way, I wouldn't be causing any disturbance to the kingfisher coming in the nest. It would come by me if it wanted to, and it would go into the nest and feed and come out no problem at all. So technically, would I need a licence for that? Well, it's a grey area, and I think, no, if you're not causing disturbance, you know, I normally say 50 metres away from a kingfisher nest. Other people would disagree with me greatly, but that's what I normally say. And don't think because you're 50 metres away, you're not going to get any pictures, because you are. You put a post up in the river, a really nice one, where maybe there aren't any posts. Unfortunately, around here, there's far too many. But if I put one in the river, um, the kingfisher might come and land on it before it goes in the nest, because it likes to check if the coast is clear. When it's got a fish, you get kingfisher and a fish. And then when it comes out from the nest, it will land on the post and bathe itself. So you get it shaking and preening. It can be really, really, really cool. And of course, if you put that post up, it will get used to it. And in the winter season, when it's not nesting or after, I think the license goes from March the 30th to middle of September. After that time, the kingfisher is still going to use the post and you can use it and you'll get normal, really good kingfisher pictures. So you have to look at these licenses with a pinch of salt. Let's say you had a barn owl, right? And it's nesting inside a barn. As long as you don't go inside that barn, you're not causing any disturbance to the barn owl. If you're sitting outside in your car uh, with a window down, you know, with a beanbag, photographing it, and it comes out and looks at you on the window and kind of looks at you and stuff, you're not causing it any disturbance because you're not going into its nest, okay? I keep doing this, because uh, you're not going into its nest. So you're not causing it any stress. So in my view, you don't need a Schedule 1 license to be doing that because you're not within close proximity of the nest. If you want to climb the rafters and hang from the girders and photograph the young at the nest, then you would need a Schedule 1 license for that. And personally, that's not something I want to do, so I, I'm not interested. Now, I've held Schedule 1 licenses for ospreys, peregrines, tons of barn owls, stone curlews, and I've always done it uh, because I've needed to be closer to the nest uh, than the 50 metre mark. Uh, for the ospreys, I did it for publicity for the Duffet Osprey Trust, and I wasn't anywhere near the nest, but it's such a sensitive species that you, you know, some of these things, you need to have a license to even think of photographing in the region. Uh, because you can disturb them. You know, you go into the field where the osprey nest is, the parent will come off the nest, or if it's coming in with fish, it will abort. It won't just come back if you're walking across the field. So that's why these licenses are in place to protect the nest. And anyone who's really close to the nest or underneath it is deemed to be doing no good because you haven't told anyone that what you're up to. So don't think that you can't photograph these species like barn owls and kingfishers. You can, you've just got to be careful. Imagine that another situation, right, scenario, it's a paid hide. You go lots of really cool paid kingfisher hides around the country. You know, you're not idiots like me. You haven't got time to do all this kind of stuff. You've got real lives. So you can pay to sit in a hide, but someone's done all the work. Let's say the kingfisher nest is 10 metres away. 
okay? That's within range of disturbance if you were sitting like that, but you're not sitting like, like this. You're not sitting like this. You're in a hide that's been there forever that the kingfisher is used to. It flies onto the perch. It doesn't care whether you're near, there or not. So would you need a license for that? Absolutely not, in my opinion, okay? So, because that's a different setup. It's just common sense. But here, where I am doing a wild virgin kingfisher site, totally. I've applied for the license, okay, so that everyone here knows what I'm doing. I'm not going to say that I'm going to find the nest, and I'm not going to say that I'm even going to put the hide right here. I'll probably put it right over there in the bushes, because you've, you know, it, it doesn't give me carte blanche to do what I want. I've still got to be really respectful, because it's given to me on trust. It's absolutely given to me on trust, and I'm not going to break anyone's trust, especially the kingfishers. So I hope that's cleared up some grey areas. It's just common sense okay don't think people are playing big brother they're not but it's just a bit of common sense if you think you're going to cause disturbance don't do it sit further away get a license or find another species that's happier for you to be around in fact you before you even think of photographing a schedule one species you should be photographing common stuff. I did blue tits, blackbirds, all of these species. You learn about disturbance, you learn about how close you can get, you learn about the signs that they give you when they're disturbed, and you kind of cut your teeth on these kind of species before you go onto the species where you can really cause them stress if you disturb them. All right, so I, anyway, I hope that was useful. Um, and this is what Zoomed In is all about, giving you this real extra in-depth content. Welcome to Zoomed In, and this is the part of the show where I'm going to look at the pictures that I shot during the main wild angle feature, which was kingfishers on the river. Now, I didn't get a lot of kingfisher pictures because I was only there for a very brief time. It was a very brief encounter. See what I did there, link with the movies. <laughs> And um, <laughs> I couldn't control the situation very well. I could only put my bag hide in one place. I couldn't control where the branches were and I wasn't going to put any branches in. So it's very much to sit there and see what happens. And I think actually it's a lot of fun because of that. And I got some half decent pictures. The thing that I like about these pictures, the one that you see here is the forest canopy. It's different. I've got lots of kingfishers on the stick, no background, diving, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I like to get different pictures to add to the collection because once you've photographed your 10th kingfisher, then your 11th is pretty much the same. And for me, it's probably about my 200th kingfisher. So I've got to look at different things that I'm doing, okay? And so I like this forest canopy. Now the settings that I've got, ISO 800, um, which gave me a shutter speed of a 200th of a second at F4. Um, first of all, let's deal with the shutter speed. I wasn't going to do any diving. I didn't need anything else. Um, the light was pretty grim in there. I've shot these quite bright. So I, that's why I wanted to keep the ISO 800. I didn't want to go up to 1600 and risk getting a little bit of noise. And you get noise with any camera in grim light. Don't think that these are bright. They're not. Okay, it's a very grim condition. So it's a balance between, you know, raising the ISO and then having an image where you've got to waste your time taking the noise out. So I thought, well, I'll keep it at ISO 800. Um, because I'm shooting at f4 on the on the 600, which is great, um, it will keep my shutter speed at a 200th of a second. That's stable enough for me to hand hold, because of course I've got seven stops of stabilization in the body on the Olympus, not on the lens, in the body. And that's, you know, in this kind of situation, it's a real godsend to have that. It's absolutely fantastic. I don't know why I keep winking like that. Um, it's really great to have it. So those settings were good enough uh, for me in these conditions, because I wasn't doing diving. Here I've got a single focus point that I've got on the eye. Um, because I'm not looking in the viewfinder, uh, I'm, I'm using the screen tilted up. Um, you could turn on the uh, touch screen if you want and use the screen to focus. You've got to be careful that you can separate that from the shoot. You don't want to just press the focus and it takes 20 frames a second. Uh, so I prefer to use uh, the joystick. It's pretty easy to position the joystick over the eye. You can get a nice focus point. And I like the composition here, you know, um, if you divide my center line down the middle, which is actually the green dot here where you are, I can divide it down the middle and I've got the eye slightly on that side, looking in dead space on that side. It's quite interesting, the foliage, I like it. Um, it's taken no processing to do these, okay? Just brighten them up a bit. Whenever you've got images that are slightly in the dark, don't make the mistake of over-processing them, under-process them, if anything. So this is nice, it's got enough colors um, and it's got enough surroundings. All right, let's look at the next one. Yeah, so it shifted along a bit, bit more of a classic kingfisher pose. Again, it's hidden, but I don't mind the hiding bit. I think it's actually all right because that is nicely out of focus. If that branch there, if I'd have shot that at F16, which I wouldn't have done, but that branch would have been sharply in focus. It would have been naff because it would have been distracting. Because it's out of focus, it's not distracting. And I think it actually adds into holding the composition on this side allowing the kingfisher to look across the frame into all the dead space there, all the corners and all that. Well, they've got bits and pieces in them, um, mainly green. 
But again, it's that interesting, it's almost like a palm tree in the background. I really like that. And I really like that attitude of the Kingfisher where it's starting to look and it's starting to look interested and alert. Talking of which, this is when it flew onto the branch. Now that's actually quite a lovely branch. Um, you can see there's a, there's a bit of broken off branch right in the middle. I didn't do that, okay? That's not something that I did. That's kind of natural. So I'm gonna, you know, I could have put mud on it. I could have put some, cloned something over it, but I just left it because it was a very natural branch and I like the coloration. Again, divide the center line here, which is you down the middle. I've got the Kingfisher on that side, looking into the dead space. In fact, looking into the bottom corner, if you look at that, which is really nice composition. So it flows in from that side. Composition is all about flow. Flows in and flows out through the corner. It leads your eye into it. It's a very nice picture. No need to be zoomed in. No need to be anything else. It's got lovely, lovely space. And I really like it. Um, oh, here's him looking over his shoulder like that, very coyly. I love it when they do that. Of course, the problem at this point is where do you get the focus? Where do you put the focus? Because if I was to focus on the eye, the Kingfisher is not straight. It's, if you imagine looking at it from the side, there's its beak, there's its back, it's leaning like that. So if you focus on the eye, the tail's gonna be out of focus an awful lot. If you focus on the tail, the eye's gonna be out of focus. What do you do? I focus just on the back, just where the shoulder, imagine where the shoulder is, kind of there. Um, with most lenses, you get two thirds, you get a third in front and two thirds behind in focus. That's the way that they work. Uh, so by not focusing on the eye, by focusing on the shoulder, I managed to get lovely detail on the back of the Kingfisher um, and lovely detail on the head as well. You can see it's a youngster, it's very beautiful, but I just love again the flow where it comes in and out and it's clearly looking at something and really nice background over the top as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> here he is. This is the last one in the sequence I'm going to show you. And again, he's clearly looking at something. It's actually um, a, a plane going overhead. Um, I have no idea why kingfishers, they just look at anything that goes by. So this is a plane and he was watching it and watching it. I've even seen them fall off the perch as well, which is really funny when they do it. Of course, not if you're a kingfisher. Um, but again, this is a really interesting picture because it's, it's got this leading line coming out of the bottom there. Kingfisher coming straight up into the corner. So it's a jud, jud composition. That's not a word, jud, jud. There you go, try and spell that one. Um, that's what the composition is. It's not quite going into the top corner. I couldn't get it there, um, but it's going kind of close enough into that way. But it's just a lovely composition. And when kingfishers do this, when they look straight, it's really, really nice and you want to give them some space. Anyway, there you are. Hope that you enjoyed that little bit of critique, a little bit about composition. You know, the, the, the moral of the story is here that you wanna take pictures that are different and not the same as everyone else. And you wanna take pictures that are different from what you've got before. There's no point if you've got kingfishers on the stick going out and take them on the same stick the next night. You wanna be changing it all the time, changing the position, changing the composition. Kingfisher doesn't care, but your photography does and it will keep your photography fresh and interesting. All right, that's all from me for now. There you go, that's gonna give you an idea of what Zoomed In is all about. Maybe I should do a little dance as well, la la la. So we'll see you next week where the theme will be, haha, <laughs> I'll tell you next week. There will be the normal show with the normal silly Andy Rouse and the normal critiques. And then afterwards we'll have the premium content, which you can get or you can't, and if you don't, I'll come to your house and dance like this and sing like this and do everything that a 50-year-old should do. Yeah, I know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Too much sugar, that's what it is. Um, I hope that you enjoyed today, and uh, I'll be back again very, very soon. Bye!